but but the but but, the, but most fans don't they they kind of give a shit, but they don't. They just like just put it out. Who fucking cares? Want to go and tour? And it's like my job is like I'm in between the label, <laughs> the publisher, everybody, just trying to keep everyone sweet. Yeah. But Grenin's great because, and I think the reason he has success is because he fucking listens. Mm-hmm. And it's when when artists have some success. And then they think they've got all the fucking answers. Mm-hmm. Is when you start having your problems. Yeah, yeah. I'll get. I mean, I know that 100 percent from, you've, from you've my been side. There. Yeah, it was like you know. I don't know if you know the story, but. So John Dawkins, welcome and thanks for talking us, to us today. Uh, thanks for having me on, mate. It's a pleasure. Likewise. So um, for viewers and listeners who don't know, John is one of the head honchos at uh, VAM, Various Artists Management, um, who look after a whole range of artists, producers, songwriters. But to get a picture, if you think of Killing Joke all the way through to LaRue and many points in between, you'll get a kind of picture that's not genre specific. Yeah, but um, it's really interesting to talk to you today, John, because we've so far we've spoken to about fifteen um, artists, musicians, bands, producers. It's really good to get your take on what it is about making music and why it's important for more the management side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, we're going to be talking to three of your artists over the next uh, two weeks or so. But yeah, before, yeah. before we get into all of that, super serious question. Bear in mind that most people on the outside looking in think of music as some impossible dream or something incredibly lucky to have a career in what on earth made you want to have a career in music well uh, do you know what it's funny actually and it's funny talking to you because it's records like mosley shoals and margin already and definitely maybe and mm-hmm. you know records like that that they 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 encapsulate a time in my life where I was always in love with football, but I always had a, a love for music. And and I think both of them went hand in hand beautifully for me at a time where I feel I'm very fortunate to, to, to have grown up in that era. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just important records that helped um, shape my life and helped me through difficult situations and in the good times. Yeah. And, it, you know, music's always something that I've just gone to it every every morning when I'm ever I'm in a bad mood I'm a good mood it just soundtracks your life and yeah. and it's just something that I've always loved and I've loved the way that music can shape popular culture and I've just wanted to for me um it was just something that was always naturally something I wanted to get involved in I just you know I used to read the, the sleeves in records and I'm really important with my artists that I work with now about the detail that goes mm-hmm. into them records and reading it and trying to work out how a record's made and and i just love i love all that man i love all the detail of what the record means and even like the endings of songs yeah. like the last 10 seconds of songs is so important and i don't know it's just i just I've, i guess my mum was a first generation skinhead my dad was a mod so i grew up in a household of great music so yeah um yeah i just i just it was just something that i i just went for in the end and i and and in a in a it's mad, really, because I look back and think, fucking hell, what on earth were you doing? Yeah. But it's just this blind faith that it's just going to happen. And yeah. You just keep going. And, and I'm glad I did because I love going to work every day. Um, and it is, you know, there's ups and downs, but mm. I love the idea that I'm helping artists realise their dreams and also making records for the 14-year-old me who was in a bedroom, you know, in a working-class area in Coventry, trying to understand life yeah. you know and that's amazing yeah. you know you know you've, you've done it yourself totally. you're not dead. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. if you'd asked me that question i'd have said pretty much exactly the same thing it was yeah. like a love of football which within itself is like a culture and a sense of belonging mm. and then the upbringing of like uh, um, um, skinhead and mod so then you've got a culture you want to belong to and then mm. you fall in love with the music and it's like this is something to pin yourself to, to that is bigger than the sound itself, isn't it? All the details. It's, work, it, it, it's working out who you are. Yeah. So, like, where, where I grew up in Coventry, you know, it's really funny because you, you, you're proud of where you're from, but then in my community there was loads of Irish people. So it was yeah. like 
I almost thought Celtic was a local club when I was growing up, you know. So you had that side of things. But then you had everyone, all these kids that were born in Coventry, but they would say they were Irish. Yeah. And so you had that side of things. And then, you know, and I was always like, well, I'm proud to be English. And I always thought I am proud to be English. But then I hated the idea that the flag had been stolen mm -hmm. uh, for a shit identity. And I kind of feel to a point I want to get on a mission to reclaim the flag. And, you know, for the good people, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just sick of seeing, like, anything that's just remotely stupid, like that gathering in Hyde Park oh, where people yeah. are like, you know, and then all of a sudden there's always a fucking flag to ruin, like, stop ruining what, my, my culture, you yeah. know? I want to change that. Because there's a lot to, you know, I, you know, the idea that these people surely don't understand the history of this country because yeah. it's like, just read the books. And it's like, there was a lot to be ashamed of, but also... There's a lot to be proud of, mm -hmm. and but it's articulating it in the right way so I don't look like some daft nationalist like all these <laughs> other idiots. So it's like you're kind of in this kind of no-man's land yeah. because I vote Labour. I will always vote Labour, even though I wasn't a massive Corbynite. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Keir looks, Keir looks really promising, I've got to say. Um, but, um, yeah, it's strange, isn't it? I kind of feel like I'm in a bit of a no-man's land. So I'm on this mission to try and find the balance and try and reclaim it in some way, you yeah. know, for, for the good people. Yeah, well, it's a bit like, if we go back to the, you know, the Britpop thing, you know, with Oasis and all that kind of stuff with the Union Jack, that was getting towards there. Even though you had a lot of idiots then jumping on it and, you know, the lad culture, which the journalists created, because, as, again, it was just a bunch of people loving music. Yeah. And then it started to become a thing, then the fashion houses took it on and then it became a... Tony Blair jumped on it and it becomes twisted but the, the the concept of create you know reinforcing the positive side of shit is is what is where it's at isn't it i think i think yeah i think you're right and i think i think if it's female driven mm -hmm. you've got half a chance yeah i remember you know like when the spy girls got hold of it it was you know it's a different entity there. it's a different beast isn't mm -hmm. it um i always find it weird with oasis that they kind of took it on it was more of a more of a who kind of not to the who wasn't it you know but the kids are all right or whatever but you know their irish heritage i always thought it was very strange yeah. that noel had a british flag guitar but whatever man yeah. um, but it was good times wasn't it i mean but then if you fast forward kind of 10 years later i remember mm. doing the first enemy record and all of a sudden i got an alert one day that the british national party were using an enemy song Ooh, fuck. on their thing. And I was like, fuck, you know, I mean, if ever the messaging was taken completely the wrong way, I mean, it was such a socialist record, mm. that enemy record. And all of a sudden they were using one of the songs, You're Not Alone, as if it was like some kind of, you know, we're all in it to kind of right wing nonsense. And oh, God, I sued the arse off on me. I Good. went to town on them, you know, because that was actually about the, um, you know, the trade unions going in and trying to sort out, uh, the Coventry car factories, and then them just collapsing. That's mm. what that song was about. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because if you if you if you have a lad in a pair of Adidas trainers and um, a Union Jack flag, it's, you you just it, it just stinks straight away. Even before you know who the person is or what <laughs> they stand for, it's really difficult. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it's like a Stone Island jacket, um, and people don't know the history of Stone Island. Obviously, coming out of Italy, it was a casual brand with working class lads who drank outside coffee shops and mm -hmm. it's very trendy brand. Mm -hmm. So when you first started wearing that, it was great. And then all of a sudden all the idiots get on it and you have to put it back in the in the wardrobe for 20 years, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's difficult, it, you know? It is, no, totally. It's like Stone Island, CP and Company. Yeah, I mean, Bellstaff kind of, you, you kind of avoided that because I mean, originally Bellstaff was from Leicester anyway and then it was, yeah. all went defunct. The Italians took it on, which is where I saw it. I brought yeah. my Bellstaff back from Rome Weller sees it, Liam sees it, they're like, we need one. And then before, yeah. before you know it, this is a good thing, obviously, for, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there's loads of kids in the audience wearing it, and you're like, okay. When but it's, it's, like, it's like anything, isn't it? It's like, they, people just get it wrong, don't yeah. they? It's like when people are like, oh, I love, a, I love Ocean Colour Scene, and then they, they, get the wrong, like, they get the wrong side of it. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, totally. Like, and then they do a cover and you're like, oh, fucking hell, you yeah. missed the point. You, you know? missed the point, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, 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 it's a difficult one, but I just hate that. I hate the idea that anything outside of London that 
isn't someone who's either middle or upper class and is a lad in a band who's just dismissed as lads. It's fuck. It drives me mad. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. Really, really frustrating. I don't. I don't know if. Did you ever have any issues with that yourself when you were in Ocean Coliseum? Oh, totally. We would, yeah. be, you know, I mean, the press would just go, "You're all just a bunch of idiots," you know. You're all thick. You're all that. You're from Birmingham. Even though I'm, a, I'm a Scouser, you're all thick brummies and blah blah blah. Like just dismiss this music mm. that we thought was brilliant. Our audience thought was brilliant. Was really meaningful. It's like, yeah, well, you know, you're not from London, so you're not cool. And because you're working class, you've got to be thick. Right. It's interesting because I always kind of, you know, people in the industry ask you, oh, "What's your favourite band?" And you know, you know, what people are like they're like. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to, like, Lightning Bolt and Can, and, you know, and you're like, oh, fuck off, mate. And then I, I say, oh, you know, I loved Ocean Colour Scene and Oasis, and people are like, you know, as if you get looked down, and I'm like, yeah. well, let me tell you something. Like, you know, even in 97, I remember um, going to see you lot, and I think you were the big... I think you knocked Oasis off the top yeah. spot, and I think you were the biggest grossing live band in 97. Yeah. You know, when Oasis were, like, maybe at their peak anyway, yeah. just coming off cycle. Yeah. It's fucking massive. I don't think people realise that. Yeah, I know. I know Noel still owes me 100 quid. <laughs> because he was like, because you know, they put it out and I said, I will knock you off the charts. He's like, I bet you 100 quid you don't. Yeah, man. He's like, and he still never paid up, but he wouldn't anyway. <laughs> Ali, he's got alligator arms, that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's got short arms and very deep pockets, that boy. That's it, that's it. But okay, so if we go, I mean, so where did it start then as a career? Because obviously you were kind of really linked with the, with the enemy, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I do you know what I, I did? A, I'm a, I did a sports science degree, mm -hmm. um, and then what did I do after that? I went to Land Rover weirdly, and I was answering mm -hmm. the phones about vehicles I couldn't give a shit about. But it was just a stopgap <laughs> while I got a job in Camden at the Barfly, right? Okay. Which, which, which at the time, two thousand and one, two, three, and four. That was like the epicenter of the world for mm -hmm. that second wave of like the Strokes, the mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, and I was there, man. I was I was working behind the bar there. But in the meantime, my cousin was signed. Um, he moved from Coventry to Toronto in the mid eighties because my uncle went and worked for. My uncle actually launched the Mac with Steve Jobs. He was the oh, vice right. president of he was right. vice president of Apple Mac in Canada right. uh, in the eighties. Yeah, mad story. He. he he was on computers in the late 60s and tried to put the computers in the car factories in the Midlands and they weren't having it. Right. So he right. could have saved the car industry and got, got them ahead, but no one listened, so he just moved to Canada. And, mm. and he's one of the first 50 employees at Apple, That's bizarrely. Wow. Mad story. And um, so my cousin went moved to Canada and he, he signed to Sub Pop in the late 90s. Okay. Uh, he, he was in like a punk band. And there was loads of bands coming through, like Super Suckers, at the drive-in, mm -hmm. uh, Murder City Devils, all that stuff. He was in the band there. Then he joined a band called Amen that were on Virgin. Real heavy band, actually. Uh, but he, he, I just started working with him, like tuning his guitar, driving the van. Didn't have a clue, Dave. Mm -hmm. I, honestly, man, I didn't have a clue. But I just, he knew that I was hungry. Yeah, yeah. So I did that, and I worked at the bar. And then uh, the manager actually uh, was English, uh -huh. even though they were based in LA. And it turns out now he's my business partner. So I was doing a bit of scouting for him on the mm. side. And then that was kind of 2003, four, and then it just rolled from there. And then the first band I managed on my own was The Enemy, mm -hmm. which was a weird thing because within 14 months, 15 months taken on, we'd gone from nothing to number one. Yeah. So it was amazing, but it was like a bad lesson because yes. it don't happen. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't know about that first Ocean Colour Scene record. Oh, yeah, totally. Know? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. People think, you know, Mosley's the first record. Mm. It's a hard, hard slog, isn't it? You know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, going back with my lot as a case in point, it was the making of that first album and then getting dropped on purpose then yeah. enabled us to have the freedom and also the experience to make Mosley Shoals. Yeah. Because if we just come out the bat with Moji Shaws, number one, we wouldn't have been able to make some of that quality. Yeah. And we wouldn't have built up a shitload bank of songs to then to be able to do a follow up really quickly. Because that's always the story, isn't it? It's like, where's the next record? Particularly if you've had a successful one, the label's like, right, go on tour and write the next record oh, and hey, deliver it's it. It's impossible. That's why everyone fucks it up. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. I'm glad you said that. Because I always thought, I, you know, I actually think Marching already is stronger. Uh huh. I, well, I, I don't know about that, but it's one that I revisit more. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting that you would have had them in the can, I think. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. totally. And all, you know, I mean, the B-Sides album as well, which we put out in which between. Is a, which is amazing, by the way. Yeah, but if you look at that, that that's like 80 songs or n nigh on. But yeah. we'd written them over the three years where we didn't have a deal, you know. Mm. But um, so, I mean, I, I was talking to a producer called Tom Manning, who used to be an assistant engineer. And the first big session he did was the Enemy's second album. And assisting on that is why he fell in love with the idea of a group of people making music. And that's why he wanted to become a producer instead yeah. of just being an assistant engineer. Was he was he at Assault and Battery or did yeah. he work with Mike Crossy? Uh, with Mike. Yeah. And that, it was that process. And he was just looking in on this, this, this core team of people. Obviously, there was issues around it, you know, because like, we've had this huge record and now we've got to follow it up and, you know, all those pressures which come on. But he felt the, the camaraderie and the setup. He said, mm. and that's what inspired him to go, right, I'm going to move to London and become, you know, actually live in London full time and become a freelance Amazing. producer. Yeah. But, um, so, what, so then, so what, what, how did it then progress with the enemy then? So why did that grow up? Well, obviously the band and all that, but what kind of happened? Oh, it was a funny one, that, because the drummer worked for my mum, mm -hmm. uh, Coventry at Federal Express, and she said he just used to drum on the desk all day. And then he was like, he worked out that I was working for a management company in London, which mm -hmm. is obviously where we're from, it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just nonsense. And he, he sent the demo through my mum, and my mum was like, have a listen to it. And my mum is someone that I will always play music to. Mm -hmm. um, it's, she, I really trust her because she's just really honest, you know, and like... Um, and she just kept badgering me. And I must have sat on it for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then eventually got around to listening. And I was like, this is fucking great. But it, it kind of come a year and a half into me scouting. So I'd kind of, I was on early, I was early on loads of stuff like mm -hmm. Future Heads, Kaiser Chiefs, Gallows, tons of bands that had gone on and done well. So I knew that I, I know that I knew, well, I knew that I knew what I was on about. Mm -hmm. And I had my finger on the pulse, but there was something special in that. But it was also meant a bit more to me because it's obviously somewhere, something from my hometown yeah. that um, obviously obviously understood um, what they were trying to say, and they had somebody who was articulate enough to carry the message and say it. And I was like, actually, this is like the specials, but thirty years on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there hasn't been a band out of my own city for a long time. And all of a sudden, I was thinking. Yeah, this is a really interesting package. So I went and met them, and as soon as I met them and then started talking to them, I was like, fucking hell, this could really work. So I knew that they were... I'd done my calls, and I was told that even at 18, they were like... The drummer was into Bill Bruford and Jazz Fusion. Mm -hmm. He was an excellent drummer. Uh, Tom, the singer, was like self-taught, like, pianist. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's an exceptional musician. And then Andy, their mate's kind of not the best bass player in the world, but became good, mm, you know what I yeah. mean? Because he just grafted and grafted and grafted. And he was the one that connected with the fans. And um, it was just, it, I just looked at it, I thought, this could really work. Yeah. And obviously there was a movement going just after the Arctic Monkeys where that sound was quite prevalent. And we just got our asses in gear, started recording up at uh, the original Vader Studios mm -hmm. in Stratford with Matt, because mm -hmm. I knew Matt from old, and um, banged a few demos together. And then all of a sudden put a few gigs on in Cov and it just fucking spiraled out of control really quickly. Never, never happens like that. I mean, yeah. just the, and I do believe that things, the stars just aligned a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just meant to be because I know far more now than I did then, like tenfold. Mm -hmm. But, you know, having that magic and that journey, you know, you, you can't replicate that. No, no, I know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So then when, so obviously the enemy and then obviously for all the, Myriad reasons that bands do split up and all that. So then, yeah. so then, what, what? Then where were you? Because obviously you're not managing them anymore. Well, I, I actually, I did uh, some stuff with the Twang in the Fratellis. I've, mm. I've known the Twang for years. Um, good guys. Very. Again, another band that's very misunderstood and mm. kind of just thrown in with the lad lad band thing. And when you meet Phil the singer, especially very intelligent lad, but great record collection. Mm. Like. You know, amazing record collection. He's found a lot of bands that have gone on to do well. Uh, made a couple of records with those guys. I opened a nightclub in Coventry. Um, I always wanted to do that. Um, and I had a few quid around me. Um, and I thought, right, let's do it. So we opened a 1500 capacity warehouse. Right. Uh, did that for a year and a half. I had a multitude of problems with the, uh -huh. the old bill and yeah. councils, as you do. Uh, but we had everyone play there from like Pete Tong to Scream to, you know, all the biggest DJs in the world. So that was amazing to do that for a moment. 
And then I kind of got to like 33. Uh, and I thought, why? All of a sudden, I found myself outside of the music industry, uh-huh. as you can do. And you yeah. move back. I moved back from London back to Coventry for a bit to do the club. And all of a sudden, I found myself a little bit out of the mix. And I, and I just thought, I'm fucking, I'm good at this. I'm not great at it, mm-hmm. but I think I'm pretty good at it. And I, and I, and I feel like I want to go back and I want to, I want to get my hands dirty again. And that's what I did. I kind of just came back down the road and reconnected with Dave again, who I worked with all them years ago. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, obviously we, I just got back into the company and got up and running again, made a couple of records and then, you know, here we are kind of thing. Yeah. And we've got, God, we've got loads of acts and we've got a really good team there, you know, and everyone's on the same kind of mission statement and everyone's got the same end game and, and no decisions based on money. It's all uh-huh. based on the art. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've sold, Banksy artwork to make an album for a band because I couldn't get the right record deal. Now I call it art for art. Yeah, I was going to. Say, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to bring that up because I saw that the other day. Yeah, it's for the but exit it, calm thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it's mental. <laughs> but um, I believe that that was that was what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I could look at the picture on the wall all day, but mm-hmm. I was desperate to hear this record, and that's what you do, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you have to have a real connection with people if you're going to work with them because yeah. you're in the trench together. You know, I yeah. mean, it's fucking hard work. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if there's a loose link, it can be a real problem, you know. And, totally. and with everyone I work with, certainly with Grennan as much as anything, it's like family, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the way you said that there, that's why I really wanted to talk to you. And also, that's why I think the, your company it really stands out, maybe like um, Good Soldier as well to some degree, as like these independent companies... Yeah. That actually, okay, everyone's wise, it's a business, you've got to make money, but by putting the, the art and the artist first and financial decisions second, that then enables you to make art, which is what people connect to long term, isn't it? Yeah, I agree completely. I don't think, I think the idea of running after, I mean, God, I can't think the last time we had a big, big single mm. because we don't. We don't think like that, and a lot of people now don't think in album terms mm. either. But we're different like that. We we do feel that that is the important side of of the art, if you like. You know, um, I'll never I'll never turn my back on the album. I mm. think it's fucking crucial. Even though I saw something on uh, Twitter or Instagram the other day where there was a kid, and it was like he said to me, he must be like twenty one. He was like. Hey, I'm going to do that top ten albums thing that all the old people are doing that no one under twenty five does. And I thought, fucking hell, he's probably right. <laughs> all the old people. I know, but then, but then I thought about it, Dave, and I was like, mm. I've got all my old records out, and I've really reconnected with mm. them over um, this period, and I'm, I don't have many new records in there because mm. a maybe I don't consume music as much that way anymore myself, but mm. B, I don't think there's been that many great records been made. Yeah. I don't think people think like that, you know? No, no totally. I mean, the last... I mean, Light and Matches, definitely, which is Tom Grennan's one. And with all of these, we're going to put um, links to uh, Amazon Music as well. Yeah. So that people yeah, get right. paid. Um, <laughs> but the last for one... For change. From, exactly, for a change. <laughs> Might be small, but it all adds up. Was um, yeah. the, the, the first Bad Sounds album, which I got on vinyl. Great that's why record. they did the TCT gig, which Tom did with yeah. Rich. Yeah. Um, and that's actually an album. Because you can mm. tell by their influences that they listen, the artists that influenced them made albums. Yeah. You know, singles were taken from albums to promote an album, you know. I mean, it's like, if you know, with Tom, it's obviously, you know, Lighting Matches, Top 5. Yeah, it's yet, dead true for that. Yeah, yet to have a hit single, but his fan base and his live fan base. It's massive. Yeah. yeah. So you don't need to have it. It's nice to have one because then you know. Oh, we... don't get me wrong. We'd lo- we'd love one, but uh, uh, not at the expense of anything. Then, mm-hmm. as soon as you start going running after things, you know, you only have to get it wrong twice, and you 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 spend, you know. Yeah. Oh, totally. And also, if you're running after trying to make a hit single, you're losing what it is that your fan base connected to in the first instance was. Which is what I think, and I know, I know you're the same, and I 100% presume Tom is the same, and Zuzu and LaRue and, and everyone on your roster, is to make something that's true to you and what you want to stand by and be proud of. If yeah. that then happens to get A-listed on Radio 1 and become a big hit single... Amazing. All the merrier, yeah. But it's like, you, you know, it's a very simple method, isn't it? It's mm. like, going back to Ocean Colour Scene, right? We know we have the hit singles on, on the record, mm. which are fucking amazing. 
right? And they're great songs. They record the train or whatever it is, uh, mm. July, whatever record it is, mm. there's always a great lead single. But they're not the songs that ever resonated the most with me. Yeah. You know, never. It, it's, it's things like uh, It's My Sh Shadow or Emily Chambers or yeah, yeah. Robin Hood. You, you get what I mean? They're the ones that really affect you because. So they're like, they're like almost necessary evils, but you'll only play the game so far. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, totally. So the method's always been, it's still the same 25 mm. years on, mm -hmm. you know. I don't think that'll ever change, but I think the way that we consume music is changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, 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 the way that the charts work is a bit of a problem for me because of the way that the playlists are algorithmed within Apple and Spotify in the sense of I've got people that have got millions and millions and millions of streams that mm. will have a top 40 single but couldn't do a 500 capacity venue in London, yeah. whereas I've got a Tom Grennan who's not had a top 40 single but can do 10,000 tickets in London. Yeah. So it's like, where's the balance of merit, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and also all your playlists, all the algorithms, and then they're all, we all know how it works, you know, all the majors have, have heavily influ influenced them as much as they can. You know, it's it's that side of it, but then you know, then the upside of it is people who really love music will buy the Tom Grennan and Am, or they'll stream it enough so it becomes a sale, and they'll yeah. buy his tickets and go and see him. Well, that's it. I mean, that that's the beauty of it. I mean, the up, the up, the up, upside is is the the live ticket for mm -hmm. sure. But I think I think the idea that. Um, we're definitely losing culture in terms of the way that we purchase albums, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the days of going in the record shop and seeing the older kids having to flip through at records and then going around and seeing what they were looking at and then maybe having the bollocks to ask them mm -hmm. what they're like, you know, they're long gone. <laughs> but the print press is, is struggling, there's no doubt about that. But then the social media platforms now, they're your TV and your press. Yeah. So, you know, how do you then use those algorithms to get past the idea that people are just looking at what they want to look at? How do you get to them? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's through social media. So what we found with Corona is, is you can't promote in your traditional way. So all of a sudden, all these artists that signed in to be musicians are now got to be TV presenters and their own magazine while sitting at home. It's, yeah. it's, it's a nightmare, mate. Yeah, but, yeah. It, it 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 is what it is. It's the only game in town at the minute, you know. Whereas a Grenon going on a TV and having a good TV performance, we always see an upstream in in interest and you know the social numbers move dramatically and stuff. So, mm. you know, it, it's a different game, but it's it's it, it's an exciting game because every time you get to release it, it's a changing field. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, that's really interesting because it's not something that's in a textbook. No, you know, this is the music industry because it's just constantly, regardless of COVID, it's constantly evolving and you know morphing into millions of things. So how did you get? How did you come across Tom in the first place? Well, he um, it was a funny one because I used to have this uh, scout. Uh, well, it wasn't my scout. It was a scout for Sony TV, but it was someone I used to chat to a lot mm -hmm. called Alex Edwards. He's got a little label now called Nice Swan which is hilarious. <laughs> but he, he's actually put some, good, he's put some good stuff out. He's put some good stuff out. Um, and he came into my office randomly. Now, Grennan went to my old university, which is very right. small, be it 15 years later. But mm -hmm. I'd seen a video of him on their feed, and I was like, oh, he's, he's fucking good. Mm -hmm. And then randomly, the, a week later, this scout came in and paid me four or five things, and Grennan was one of the things. Right. And I was like, that is interesting. So I dropped him a note. Um, but he was always already being represented by somebody. And, and as it turns out, you know, six months later, he told me that he he's that chronically dyslexic. He, he couldn't really read all these emails that were coming right. in from labels because mm -hmm. he, he gave them an headache that these two Irish lads that he'd met once said, oh, we'll do your emails. And they were like, no experience. Yeah, yeah. But obviously I wasn't going to tread on their toes. So I said, no problem. Left him to it. And then it, weirdly a month later... He got back in touch and he went, oh, I know somebody who knows who you are and I think I should probably have a chat with you. And I just got back to Coventry for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, where are you? And he went, oh, I'm in Twickenham. And I said, oh, right, because of course you are. I said, I used to live in Richmond years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, meet me in this pub in Richmond. And it was a proper working class pub and I thought he'll like that. And when I got there, it turned into a fucking bistro. <laughs> so I've not been there for years. So we had a quick Guinness in there and a chat and uh, that was... That was it. And he had six months left to run on his uni. So 
Um, after the Christmas, all of a sudden this chase and status option come up. So I thought, great, do the chase and status single and then we'll build an EP while he's still at uni mm -hmm. to run off the back of that. And that's how we ran it. And that was three and a half years ago. Wow. Okay. It's been, it's been quick. It's been a quick it journey. Is. Yeah, really. So, I mean, so how was Light and Matches put together? Because obviously he's, he hasn't got a band. And no. he's, he, you know, I know um, Tom, um, Tom writes stuff, but he also does not not averse to co-writing as well. No, he, he doesn't. He quite likes co-writing. I think he, I think he finds it more interesting. Mm -hmm. I think on that first record, he bought four or five of his own, fully, fully composed and done. Uh, and then I think he's, there's nothing. He doesn't. There's not one song. There's one song on there where he doesn't have at least fifty percent of the writing on right. it. But there was a, a his A and R there at the time was a guy called Ali Fletcher, um, who's very very good A and R. One of one of the few good ones left, um, and he understood the, what the vision was when we sat down and spoke to him and just started piecing it together. Um, it wasn't a case of like old records where, or still some records are, are made like this where it'd be like one producer mm -hmm. and that was it front to back. It was a case of just breaking the record into kind of three or four sonic si situations right. and then pinning it into the right people to work out who would be best uh, to do to do what at that particular moment. So we kind of just ticked over a year of piecing that record together, slowly but surely, and mm -hmm. Tom would drop in. And he was kind of understanding what the studio was as we went along. Right. But we knew loads of good players, um, like Danny Connors, who I've known for many years. Danny was signed to Dallas Sonic in the late 90s. And um, his band was basically the Lars, but without mm -hmm. Lee Mothers. When he was 18, he had yeah. Neil Mathers on the drums and all those lads. And he, he, he kind of, he won't mind me saying this, he probably fucked his career quite badly. So he was a great person to have mm -hmm. because it was a second bite of the cherry for him, but also he would, you know, school Tom in the like, do's and don'ts, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then um, we had a young drummer um, who's now Liam Gallagher's live drummer come in and... Uh, play on the pots and pans that was great and then we had d different bass players and different different musicians that we knew coming in across the record and it kind of it was a weird experience like it's not like the idea of rolling up to a rock field or, mm -hmm. or wherever and and having four weeks and smashing a record out mm -hmm. it was kind of pieced together over a year which i'd not really done it that way before yeah, it's yeah. quite interesting yeah so where's tom at with his new one because obviously he's already had two singles out oh it's done i mean it's done, done. It, it, it was um it was meant to come out in may but with with the idea that I had a tour in October, so you would announce the tour in uh, January, uh, the end of January, uh, with you know the, all these bundles, you know, and you know you, you do your little run of in stores, and you've got, and all of a sudden you've got a ton of pre-orders, and then you box it off with the in stores in May and the tour in October. No tour. Yeah. yeah so now nice. I've got the tour. No one knows this, but I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, the tour's now in, mm -hmm. and the album's coming out. Right. You know, so it's 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 a nightmare situation yeah. because you know i've got a record label who are fucking great trying to make a uh, good of a bad situation yeah. where no one has the answers yeah. um, multiple zoom calls working towards timelines that are pretty impossible because we don't know when we can announce yeah. the tour and we're trying to make the best of a, a difficult situation but the way that i look at it is is like the first record it's like you're starting an artist again so we're going to mm. have multiple bites of the cherry uh, with releasing music before we get to the record. Right, yeah. So it won't be a traditional one or two singles into record. It'll be four or five slices of the cake and here's your record. Yeah. Which is great for us because we get more more music out. But again, like I say, radio is more difficult because there's less free plays. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to um, make the playlists be in line with the mood of the nation. So you've got all that side of things. You can't really go out and do any promo because mm -hmm. it's social distancing in fact the first bit of tv is doing is this weekend at sunday brunch where they're letting him go in oh really right actually, yeah but everyone's there's only like seven people in the studio mm -hmm. whereas normally there'd be 57 yeah 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 so you know hopefully we'll get back to some normality but i think with them loosening things at the minute we'll see another spike in two or three weeks and we'll be back to square one again which will be shit but yeah if, if not we'll start to gradually get back to some normality yeah you know? yeah and it must be hard. I mean, it must. I mean, I was exactly the same when things would like a record would get put back by a few months or a tour would get this or that, you know, and you'd have to have like a six month delay, at, you know, and you're in your early 20s. The, your level of patience is zero. 
Yeah, of course. Because you're just, it's like, oh, my record's coming out, the tour's coming up. Yes. No, just wait. But but the but but, you, but most bands don't they they kind of give a shit but they don't they just like just put it out who fucking cares want to go and tour and it's like my job is like I'm in between the label the publisher everybody just trying to keep everyone sweet yeah but Grenin's great because and I think the reason he has success is because he fucking listens mm -hmm. and it's when when artists have some success and then they think they've got all the fucking answers mm -hmm. is when you start having your problems yeah. Yeah, I'll get to, I mean, I know that 100% from, you've, you've from my side. That. Yeah, it was like, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but it was like the, at the time when everyone, you put out a single, so that's your CD one, you'd have to do CD two with a different B-side, you'd put out your seven inch with a different B-side, 12 inch with a different B-side, and a cassette. We got to the point where, okay, we've had like several number, you know, top fives, we had a number one album, and then decided to go, we're not, we're not playing the game, we're not doing all the extra tracks. Now, because of that profit in peace, which was A-listed on Radio 1, sales of CD1 would have put in, his, in the charts at number two, right? Almost at number one, but because we didn't do all the other alternative formats, and everyone yeah. else was, went in the charts at number 13, so then the shops thought, well, well let's not rack the album at the front. I, I tell you what, I remember, I, I, and I remember this vividly, I remember sitting on my couch, and my mum and dad's, I'm thinking, what year was Profit in Peace? 99? 99, yeah. Yeah, I remember being home from uni and I said, oh, bang Top of the Pops on. I said, uh, I wish you could have seen it on tonight, new single. And it was Profit in Peace. And I remember my dad watching it and it was like, in at 13. And my dad watched it and he looked at me and he went, how? And my dad never swears, right? He went, how the fuck's that not a number one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went, oh, it's a great song, isn't it? And that was that was for me watching that. I was like, "What? Why is that only 13? And I thought, and you kind of think, "Well, oh, they're losing their edge or something." Like, what? What are people turning off to it? But they weren't. It's because of that. Yeah. And that was that's a really and that little bits like that is where population go. Oh, you know, subconsciously. Yeah. And totally. that was that, that's fucking shit decision making. Yeah. And it, you you got to look at that and rewind to the Arctic Monkeys. They set their stall out right from the off. We're not doing any press, and the reason why is we're not very good at it. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. Now, if you'd have been like that from day dot, people would have known it is what it is. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, well, that and, that and solo, solo. I had the, I had the A0 solo mm -hmm. poster on, on my wall at uni, and some fucker nicked it. And I've just seen that it, they're going for 150 quid, they are. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even got one. I should have a whole stack of them. <laughs> the art, the artwork was great on that. Yeah. Who, who did it? Was it Tony? Um, it was either Tony or Lawrence Watson. I can't remember. Brilliant. Yeah. So okay. Um, this isn't uh, by uh, by everyone, everyone watching and, and listening when this comes out. This isn't a stitch up. It's not all just for me to talk about my old band. Okay. <laughs> It is. It That's is. It is. It is. The whole thing's a <laughs> setup. Um, so let's go to someone totally different. Someone who isn't yet got to where Tom is, which is Zuzu, but equally unique with a great voice and a you know their own identity and things. So how did you come across her? Uh, interesting one is with Zoo. Um, she'd had a couple of. She's she's been kind of in the industry since she was about fifteen, mm -hmm. and. I've always kind of watched her from the outside. I think she's really good. But I've, I've had managers trying to... She always sang in her Scouse accent. Um, and they had, they, uh, there's been managers that try to knock it out of her. Mm -hmm. And and they, like they've all tried to kind of... Because she was a teenager, tried to stamp their authority on what she looked like and mm -hmm. whatnot. And then I put her on a few shows with The Enemy and I thought, fucking hell, there's something really special with her. And um, I kind of watched it from afar. And then all of a sudden, um, my wife was her radio plugger for a moment and right. I, we got wind that like you know there might be an opportunity to potentially manage it and my wife started kind of helping her out and then i kind of stepped in you know when it was open for a conversation mm. stepped in and got hold of the situation and just said look you know what are you trying to achieve and streamlined it basically mm -hmm. you know just try to chop out as much bullshit as we can and then fair play though i mean the a and r at Virgin, a, a guy called Joe Etchells, um, was very brave and signed it early mm -hmm. and um, gave her an opportunity to, you know, build on a major label. 
which yeah. is which is very rare. Yeah. yeah, very rare, you know. And uh, she's got a good little business going now. Mm-hmm. And just put that first EP out, first proper EP, the A Tracker, and then um, next year we'll put a proper record out. Great, yeah. But, you know, we we it's weird with her because we've been around the block a little bit with you know your Jim Abyss and a bunch of different producers, Cam Blackwoods. We've had loads of success, but we actually find we get the best results when her fella's actual in the band as well. But mm. he's um, he's a good producer, right? And they they just work out of a little room in the Motor Museum, right? And then, okay. So they'll they'll play the tracks down, send them down to us. And there's a guy that I use who came up through Nigel Godric called Dan Grek. Okay. I don't know if you know Dan. I think I think he's probably the best mixer in the country at the minute. Right. I, I think he's unbelievable, and he'll just he'll he'll he'll, he'll do the mix, bit of ad pro, and and you're done. And it's a nice little conveyor belt. You know? Oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean that's really good. She can do it with with their fella, mm. making the sounds that they between the two of them want to, and then just get it polished up. Yeah, man, it's it's, it's, nice, it's good, man, and, and and you know they enjoy it, and and you know. The the ambition's the same, you know, um, but the journey's different with every artist, isn't mm. it? Yeah. So we, we, we're getting there now, though. You know, I mean, she could put a show on in most cities in the country outside of Liverpool uh, 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 now, uh, including London, and do 250, 300 cap plus. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, from, from nothing, it's, yeah. it's, it's great, you know. But with, with a female artist, it was always a little bit difficult, difficult I think, in the, in, the indie, in the indie game. Yeah. But, you know, it's starting to really get there. Yeah, and, you know people respect her, and you know you turn up some places and they're like, "Oh, that's a lovely guitar." Well, you actually play guitar, and you're like, "Fucking hell!" Just literally walking her away from people. Like, yeah, Fuck. and you, that's what you're dealing with, mate. You know. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, I was talking to um, Yolanda Charles, the bass player. Yeah. And uh, you know, we got into that whole thing, and also with her, we, you know, with you know elements of racism as well, and, and you know, she oh. used to get the calls of like, "Oh, right, okay, yeah, we just wanted a female bass player. We didn't realise you were going to be any good." Yeah, it's it, it's just from an aesthetic point of view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just we just wanted a girl to stand there on stage. She's, like, a, oh my she's God. a she's a great player, man. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and she's she's a diamond. Yeah. She's ace. Yeah, um, and it's funny that the whole zoo thing because I was talking to Jeff Doug Moore, the drummer, who's played on eighty three number one albums. Man. And I was yeah, and I was saying who I was going to be talking to, and I said I'm t- um, talking to Zuzo. He's like, oh, he did some co writing with her six years ago. Because he does a... Yeah. So, obviously, it's be- probably before you got involved. Yeah. On one of those early incarnations of the whole thing. Amazing. Yeah. No, it's funny. I'll, I'll have to speak to her about that. Yeah. 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 She, she's a big Evertonian like you. Well, I mean, our, when we chat in a few days, that's all it's going to be about, you know. Like, yeah, she sat, she sat in the Gladys Street end with her dad. Her dad's a massive Evertonian. Yeah. So, yeah. when she got... She got, a, she got to do something with Everton, like a playlist thing. And, yeah go down the ground, put the shirt on and all that. And she was digging out loads of the old ones, you know, like the Kinchowski Stanker shirt and stuff. Yeah. And uh, their old man, like, he was more bothered about that than anything she's done in the past. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I remember, so, just just through music, I ended up playing in goal at Dave Watson's uh, testimonial, Goodison yeah. Park, against Glasgow <laughs> Rangers. And, you know, we'd done, the, I don't know, Nebworth the week before. I mean, mum and dad had been there. And that was the proudest thing for my dad ever. Was was sitting in the main stand watching me and goal, and I was shit. <laughs> Fortunately, we had the proper Everton defenders, so I only had three saves to make and there managed managed to knee them out of the way. Good but, lad. Um, all right, so let's just move on to one more, which is Larue, who's obviously got a totally different picture than Zoo and then Tom, because she's obviously had all that success with the first record, all yeah. the troubles with um, Trouble in Paradise, all the different ways and the long wait, the big time that was took to make and all the record label intrusion wanted her to work with, you know, um, Ronson and Will I Am and she was kicking against all that. So then she, obviously she comes over to Vam. So then, you know, how did that come about? Mate, she, that was a random one really. I think she kind of almost sought out uh, my business partner, Dave, mm-hmm. uh, randomly. And um, I mean, the, 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 what's funny about her is she came with this massive reputation of, you know, being a nightmare, mm-hmm. and she won't mind me saying that. And it was kind of, that was kind of coming from major labels mm-hmm. saying this, that, and the other. But she's not a nightmare. She's just an artist that can't be moulded into something she's not. She has yeah. a clear identity and vision of what she wants to do. And if you just back her and let her get on with it, I mean, she's like, I guess she's like Prince mm-hmm. in the sense of 
it's all channeled through her like the the aesthetic the the, the songs like the engineering the the mixing it, like she's literally involved in everything mm. i mean it it's it, it, i've never there's only a few people i've met like her and and um I mean, she's just fucking unbelievable. She just she says, "Well, I'm going to do this," and you're like, "It's just not, are you? It's fucking impossible." And then all of a sudden, it will just happen, and it's there, it's in front of you. She's created this shoe that's got her face on it. You know, I mean, it's just mad. So she, her, like her drive and her vision and um, what she's trying to achieve, like it's just like she's a joy to work with. To be fair, and I and I put everybody right on that on that point that. Says so like you know they're kind of politely asking if it's a bit of a nightmare. And I'm like, no, it's fucking great because yeah. we don't have to sit off and try and help her come up with these artworks or you know culturally what's the record about and mm. you know it, it's, it's already there. Yeah, it's just pumping it full of steroids and getting it across. And like the next record that she wants to make will be completely different to this one because right. she's got a new vision that she wants to strike and. I think the reason that she took ages in between these records is because of all the problems she's had. Whereas now she's told us she feels super comfortable and wants to churn records out every 18 months, which is the best compliment we can have. Oh, totally. Know? Well, that means where she's found her home. Yeah. So it's in, instead of like people trying to mould her and saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're just letting her go she has an ama- She has amazing... Um, what's amazing about her is, is that, you know, we work so hard with other artists to try and position them in 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 press and mm. and and you know we worry about the reviews and stuff with larue honestly mate you, you just have to kind of bat it away mm-hmm. you're controlling the, the wave of it mm-hmm. more than trying to get it yeah, yeah um because she is an icon you know i mean you, and i say this if, if you if you just drew an outline of larue people would know who it was yeah oh, totally. that's very rare isn't it you know yeah yeah it's just it doesn't exist anymore no not at all not and that's what I was trying to say to like when Grannon had the little earring in his hair and beard, I'm like, that's you. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like don't veer away from it. You know, it's it, it is so right though. I mean, yeah. no one, you know, Robert Smith, um, you know, God, Adam Ant, anyone, yeah. it had a look. Larue has that the quiff. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. she says, oh, "I'm really bored of the quiff." I'm like, leave it, leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting that whole thing because, as you said, silhouette Larue, you know, it's her. It's like, yeah. you know, it's the old, uh, for me, I mean, my band that turned me into music was Echo and the Bunny Men. And when I, they used to have this silhouette of this man bunny. Yeah. And it was, that was it. That's what captured my attention along yeah. with the music was that, that's. that's... Well, we, mani- we managed them for a few years. <sighs> yeah. It was, t- you know what? I mean, D- Dave, more Dave, to be honest. Mm. I mean, he, Dave's still got a really good relationship with Mac. Uh, made a couple of good records. Um you know, and they're still, they're still, it's really weird because bunny men have just come on in the other room at my house. Bizarre. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, fucking incredible band. And he's still, he's, even though he's fucking out, I mean, that guy's a train, but. Yeah. Matt, he still sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Still sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, he asked me to join the band after Les left. Oh, wow. What year was that? So, so they got back together, met him at the top of the, TFI Friday when we were done Under Mile Eye City and they had nothing last forever. 97. That'd be 97. And then Les stuck, stuck around for a couple more years and then Les's mum got really ill and he'd, he'd had enough of Mac because they'd, they've had, you know, obviously yeah. they've been together for a thousand years. And then I met Mac a couple of years later doing a gig with Welly and he was like, hey Damon, I want you to join the fucking bands, blah, blah, blah. And if he'd asked me that when I was 16, 17, 18, I'd have died and gone to heaven. Yeah, but at yeah. that stage I was just like, can't do it. I can't go on tour with you. Just can't, can't, can't do it. I didn't say it like that. I was like, oh yeah, you know, but I'm really busy. Well, let's speak about it at some point. Yeah, but I think I think you're in a different headspace at that point, isn't it? It's like going back into that. I mean, that's a that's a heavy touring world. I, my mm. mate was a drummer for a few years, mm-hmm. um, and it's heavy, you know. But um, I think there's like two factions. Not factions. That sounds bad. But it's like two touring parties, if you like. Yeah. One who wants to go to Rome and actually have a look around and get a bit of culture, and the others are just doing what they do, you know. It's like, so, what's it like touring with Ashcroft these days? Oh, it's magic. Well, Rich is like, you know, he's about three or four years younger than me. He's got his kids. Yeah. And the way Rich sings with his voice, he can't do more than 10 shows in a month, because otherwise he wrecks his voice. 
So we yeah. tend to just do shows in school holidays or the summer, perfect. which is yeah. perfect because then you get to go in, have an amazing like three or four gigs over the two weeks, put it down for a couple of weeks and then go back into it. And his gigs are full on to play as well. Yeah, just, yeah they are. And, just, you get, and you get, uh, do you know what, mate? And you've toured the world, but you actually get to have a look around. Yeah. Oh, it's ace. Which is, <laughs> you know, know, people don't realise, you don't really yeah. get to see a lot. <laughs> no, exactly. It's mad, it's mad yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, you've been to Moscow five times. And, oh, how much have you seen of it? Well, only the last time when I went with Rich. Because all, yeah. the, all the other times, just like, <laughs> you know. Where's he living? Is he still in He's down there, actually, in um, a place called Dixon, which is about half an hour drive back away. So, oh. sort of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's then, interesting. I remember years ago when I lived in I was fucking skint. And I went into, of all places, Waitrose, just to get a bottle of water. I've told his story before. And he was behind me. This is like, oh, God, this is about 2000. Uh -huh. I, think, I think his first solo record had just come out, yeah. which is fucking great. Yeah, it is. Way. Yeah, really good. And, he, and they started scanning his, some of his shopping through on mine. And it was a right fuck up. And the, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. The girl started having a bit of a meltdown. And I thought, I said, don't worry, I'll just pay for that. It's like... I don't know, a couple of sausages, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a couple of cans of beer or whatever. And I've gone, yeah, I'll get that, mate. And he's gone, no, 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 it's all right. And I've gone, no, no, no. And I turned around and I went, I was about 20. I went, thanks for the music. <laughs> like a right knob. And he's gone, he's gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I paid for it. And it was the last tenner I had, gone. And I went out and I thought, fucking hell, thanks for the music. Fuck's sake. <laughs> anyway, about two weeks later, I saw him walking. He used to have a little black Labrador, I think uh -huh. it was. And he was walking about Labrador and he was just walking down the road and everyone was like, fucking hell, it's Ashcroft in the middle of the And he went, he saw me and he went, you all right, mate? And I went, nice one, mate. And my sister was like, what? How the fuck did that happen? <laughs> I was like, I met him the other day in Waitrose. So I was like, that was worth the tenner. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's still, he's still got his... Yeah. All right, so just to, to finish it up, I've asked everyone this and uh, some people are like, oh, you can't ask me that. Some people have got straight in. Can you pick three tunes, and we'll put a link to each, that for whatever reason stand out to out for you across this entire journey from the enemy up to right now? Three tunes? Yeah, I mean, it could be three albums if you want to go the album route. Yeah, do uh, the enemy will live and die in these towns mm -hmm. for many reasons. Um, just trying to think. That's a fucking good question, It is, Dave. isn't it? It's a bit yeah. of a question as well. Because I'm going to offend somebody, and I... <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, in the middle. Oh, fucking hell, it's tough, man. I'll probably do that Exit Calm record. Uh -huh. um, just because it was it was a time where, um, you know, bands were struggling and everyone was trying to move on and find this next thing, but there was actually a few amazing bands around it that just didn't get through. Mm -hmm. And they were one of them, where they had an amazing underground following. Um, but we just left it too long to get the record because we couldn't got, get the right deal. People just weren't touching bands. Yeah, you know, it was like the, the emergence of Calvin Harris and all that kind of nonsense. And so obviously we sold the banks. He made the record with a guy called Paddy Byrne, who's a fucking legend, um, whose great uncle actually started Celtic Football Club, which is pretty amazing. Flipping, like. And there's a picture of him on the side of the Celtic ground and it literally is Paddy Byrne. Wow. I mean, it's a spitting image of him. It's mad. We did the record with him for next to nothing. And it was just a real kind of, you know, camaraderie on making that record mm. and swimming against the tide was just fucking amazing. And we had little victories and yeah. and it come at a time where, you know, I was having a bit of a difficult patch in terms of my career as well. Mm. So it was a, a really important record, that one for me. And then the next one, probably the Grennan record mm. as well, is another important record for me because it was my first record since The Enemy that I'd put back in the top five. Right. You know, that's how long it took, you yeah. know. And I've put plenty of records out. So they'd be the three three albums for sure. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a load out. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What, about, what are the top three records that you've played on? Oh, God. All right. I'd have to say it would be Mosley Scholes just because. Just because of what it proved that we weren't wrong. No, you were right. That's yeah, exactly. Uh There's a record I was listening to last night. It's called Blue Sky Blonde by this Dutch musician called Benjamin Herman. 
who's like it's like it's like it's jazz but not jazz and um he asked me to go and play on it bear in mind he's normally plays with these hardcore jazzers but because he did some stuff well he's like i really like your bass playing so i went over to amsterdam made this record really quickly we listened to it last night fucking hell yeah. wow so i'd put that and then amazing probably maybe the last one with rich though i might go one of the weller ones maybe catch flame the live album yeah just because of all the years of, it's not this the greatest record that well that well has made obviously but just for like working on on and off with him for 12 years and that that live gig was so good the one at ali pally yeah it's great I think, what um what was the last what was the last Weller record you played on? Uh, as is now two thousand and six. Did you play? Oh, you wouldn't have played on that Sonic Kicks then. That was no, that enough. was that was two after me. So good record that. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm, hearing the, I'm hearing the new ones really good. Yeah, I mean the last thing I did with him was Glastonbury two thousand and seven, and I knew that I was never going to work with him again. Yeah, it was one of those things. It's just like it's not it's not happening. It's not do you know? Do you know Karen Williams then, Dame? Name's not familiar. She was a she was his TV plugger. Right. Okay. Yeah. She does Grenham for me. Yeah. She did. She she was the only person away. She's never sacked. I think. <laughs> and uh, she does well. Uh, she did the Lars back in the day. Fucking but hell. Oh yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. You yeah. want to get her on here, mate? Fuck, I will. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'll definitely get her on. If you could give me her email. Yeah, amazing. man. I, I, mate, anyone, anyone you think I might know, I'll, I'll help you get them, man. Yeah. 100%. Well, and, well, give me your top three Ocean Coliseum records in order. Ooh. Mar uh, March and Reddy, Moses Shoals, one for the modern. Fucking hell. Same as me. Same as me. Love Look, that. It's the way, in it? They, they are. No, but no, no B-sides, no? Uh, well, for me, the B-side is not an album. It's not an album, no, but a lot of people think it is. Yeah. But um, it's fucking brilliant. I must have bought that about four times. Yeah. I I've what? lost it. Lost it so many times. <laughs> well, I, I bought it just the other week because after the flood, I got a brand new record player and everything, and a load of my vinyl got damaged. Mm. I was going through it, and I think it was, it was either my wife or one of the kids was like, how come you haven't got any of your own records? I said, well, a lot of them got damaged, and I don't own any of them, so I just went straight on Amazon. Uh, B side, C side, free ride. It arrived a couple of days later. Stuck it on at dinner. It was like you got you got it on the vinyl, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I have to, I, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to do that. I okay. think, um, mate, all the other stuff's all the stuff's really hard to get. Yeah. What was your last record, North Atlantic? Yeah. It was 2003, 2004, yeah. or something. Yeah. I've also got some um, some music to send to you as well. I've come across three things that you might be interested in. Amazing, man. Far yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. One, I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly say them now, but one is um, this new band from Liverpool, well, from Southport, called Cr They've been okay. only, only going for about a year, year, year and a bit. It's not my cup of tea. It's quite emo rock, but they're really fucking good. I know who they are. Producers them. Oh. <laughs> there you go. I'm hey. pretty sure it's them. I'm right. pretty sure it is. There can't be many bands that's, uh, from that description that are... Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then there's a duo... Which I was, I was cross between Tom Tom Verlaine and a violin. They don't sound like that, but right. I, I know they're looking for a deal and stuff. But I hear their stuff and I think they were really good producers or songwriters. Yeah, okay. okay. And I ping that over. And there's this guy from Norway called F who writes fantastic songs, but he hasn't. Wow. Again, I think he could be a good co-writer, yeah. songwriter. No, yeah, amazing man. Yeah, yeah I'll dig I'm, in. Do, yeah. how, how far are you from Newport? About. There's a really good producer down there. He's just done Buddy John Boy's new record. Um, Gethin Pearson, do you know him? Name's familiar, yeah. Yeah, you should. I'll link you with him as well. He's a really interesting okay. character. Good good writer. Great great little producer. He just does it in this old... I can't remember. The, what are the little villages around there, the old mining villages? Fucking hell, I can't remember who he is. Yeah, I know the ones. He's in some mad little village down there anyway. And... Um, yeah, he's, he just does it in the bottom of his basement in his house. It's, it, but it's great, man. You should you should link with him. He's yeah. a fucking good guy. There's a lot of good people down that way, actually. It is. It's, fu it's funny how much music is made around this this neck of the woods as well, actually. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. You know, yeah. I suppose it's because generally there's, there was fuck all to do unless you're working in the mines, you know, and that kind of carried on. 
that's why my family all moved to Coventry because it packed up down there and they just joined the coal coal mine in Coventry. So yeah, well, there you go. yeah. Funny game. Well, listen. Um, let me know about um, anyone else you want on the roster on here, and I'll get them on. Well, great. No if we could do um, if Tom's called for Wednesday. Tom, I'll get Tom sorted. Um, did you wanted Zoo Zoo. And then Zoo and Ellie the week after or something? Yeah, man. Just have a look through the list. And if there's anyone else, not a problem. Magic. You're a gentleman. Good, good to talk to you, brother. And you. And we'll have an actual beer when we're allowed. When we're allowed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>